Okay, hello and welcome to this morning. We've got, we're not quite on the hour yet. My little wheel of death didn't go for as long as I thought it would, but we are live. And I'm just gonna wait for, ah, oh, there we go. There's the turn of the minute. Welcome, welcome everyone to the Cornet event, Cornet Global event, Flexible Working, How to Thrive and Not Just Survive. Very apt for this particular time, is it not? I'm just going to start with a little bit of admin before we dive in. Uh, we have some upcoming events at Cornet. The 28th of Jan should have the roller coaster ride of predictions and resolutions. I would love to do a compare and contrast to last year, see what see where that was. And on the 3rd of Feb, we've got the amazing Alison Rankin at Schroeder's, well worth tuning into. Um, we'd like to thank our sponsors. It has been such a tricky year and thank you so much for staying on board and staying with Cornet. It is valuable, these sessions are set up. This is gonna be a very well attended session we hear. So thank you for sticking with us. And and we come to us. I know we're only small little uh, icons at the moment, but we are the team speaking to you today. And I am going to stop this slide presentation so you can see our lovely faces. Hello. Welcome. Good morning, Good morning everybody. So today we are discussing not just how to survive the lifestyles and work styles that have been thrust upon us in recent times, but how you and your teams can thrive in this environment. So I'm Amelia Sabawal, and I'm delighted to play the chair today. I am a coach and I work with leaders on their personal, professional and presentational impact. And in a previous life, as some of you may well know me from, uh, I was a decade in the corporate real estate industry, mostly as a workplace strategist. So as a coach, I focus on the practical strategies and goals with my clients, but in equal measure and as importantly, I work with them on their mindsets to be able to achieve them. And a thriving mindset is critical to leadership both of yourself and of others. And so I think why I was brought in to run this show is because of the work that I do in building confidence and in conquering what I would call the inner critics, AKA imposter syndrome, which we all know is running rife at the moment. So for a bit of context around the session itself today, the very wise women, that are Sarah Brown and Tamara McKenzie, as you will probably very well know them from Cornet. They saw the dark side of what was emerging last year. I think we all did. And the, what was emerging around the home working environment, about around the lockdown environment, and what it was doing to people's mindsets, the effects of having a barely surviving mindset, the depression, the anxiety, the loneliness, and at its very darkest, suicide. So they asked us to form this session and really focus in on the human story of flexible working. And our intention is that you leave today with helpful thought starters that you can take back to your teams and your organizations, maybe some insightful questions for you to consider for yourself, or maybe you might see someone struggling and also some super practical activities and exercises to fold into your day so that you don't spend your days fighting reality, which let's be honest, is the epicenter of struggle and suffering. So we want you to be able to create tools and strategies for yourself so that you can navigate the next rocky road and help your teams to do so too. So that's enough from me. I'm going to pass this. Oh, I'm going to get our wonderful esteemed colleagues on the on the panel to introduce themselves and and why they're also here because they've got really interesting, very different perspectives. We're not just talking about CRE today, guys. It's about the, about the people. So they're all here to speak 
on that behalf. So I'm going to ask Lydia to start us off with an introduction and, and then go to Rachel and Chris, and then we're going to dive into the content itself. So Lydia, over to you, my dear. Thanks, Amelia. Um, good morning, everybody. Really delighted to be here today. Um, my name is Lydia Ings and I am the HR Director at Colliers International. Um, I've been there for the last couple of years, but prior to that, I have worked in, other, in, real, in the real estate industry, really, for the majority of my career and always in HR. So um, very familiar with some of the challenges that we all face and looking forward to today's session very much. Might want to put my unmute. <laughs> <laughs> Hashtag 2020 saying of the year. <laughs> Rachel, can we hear from you, please, my dear? Hi, happy new year, everyone. Um, I'll be, so I'm Rachel Edwards. I'll be sharing insights into the Loneliness Lab, which is an initiative to tackle loneliness in the places that we live, work and play. Um, it's made up of a, a community of about 800 people across um, governments, big organizations, universities, individuals, etc., who are interested in combating this and share insights, explore um, together. Um, it was co-founded by Lendlease, which is where my I spend my everyday work and passion in the future of work and workplace. Sorry, I'm getting some really bad feedback. I don't know if um, you'd mind just going, yeah, that's amazing. Thank you. I'm just Feel like I'm repeating to myself um, what I do. <laughs> um, so I'll just I'll just repeat that it was co-founded by Lendlease, um, who, um, which is where I sort of spend my kind of everyday work and passion in the future of work. Um, so as a sort of developer and placemaker, the focus was always on how the physical design um, can help to combat loneliness by understanding how people can connect meaningfully with one another. But there's also an overlay of how we can use it to influence policy and also bring programming and curation into it. Um, it is a super complex issue. So I'm, I you know, definitely don't know everything about it, but can hopefully share some insights with you. Thank you. Thanks, Rachel. So happy to have you here. Such an incredible insight. Chris, what's your name? Good Where morning. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Uh, Chris Kaufman. Um, for the last three years, I've worked with Exos, um, a US-based company uh, with a base in the UK also. Well, one of the world leaders in human performance, um, which really spans both across individuals and, and organizations and groups. My background kicked off um, culminating in a master's degree in psychology. And from there, I went on to become a coach and spent much of my career coaching. Still have a number of, of clients and athletes who I look after, but the focus really shifted for the last 20 years into working with large organizations across the UK and designing their um, relatively complex organizational well-being strategies for their people. Um, that, that tended in the past to be based very much on their culture and then the space and the budget they could permit to that. Um, and that's been an exciting journey. And then lo and behold, 12 months ago, we were hit by COVID and I guess you could say everything gets thrown up in the air a little bit. So it's been a really intriguing, if challenging year, but it's certainly created some opportunities and some trends in behavior. And I look forward to, um, to being able to share with those with you or some of those from our perspective and insight today. Thank you so much for those introductions, guys. Um, just a little note for the audience. We have a chat box which you can post questions through. The format today is that we're going to have thought starters from each of the panel. But in between, we're going to have like some discussion. We've got a few questions and bits and pieces between ourselves. But if you want to jump in and ask a question there and then about what someone's just said, Jump on in. I'll do my best to facilitate that and pop it in. We've also got time for Q&A at the end as well. So thank you, James and Kathy, for your comments already. Happy New Year. And uh, yeah, feel free to use that chat box. We'll be monitoring it as we go. So we're going to start our thought starters with Lydia. So after you, my dear. Thanks, Amelia. Um, so hi again, everybody. Um, so. I think that we all know that COVID has changed a lot about um, how we work and how we do things, um, but we're not here to talk about COVID. Um, but one of the lasting legacies from the pandemic will be the way that we all work. And what that does is that changes the relationship 
I think, between employees and employers. So rightly, there's been a lot of negative connotations uh, surrounding the pandemic. I think the overused words of challenging and unprecedented and exceptional will stay with us forever. Those words will never quite mean the same again. But I also think that through this period, there have been some positives um, about how we have all rebalanced our lives. Um, <clears throat> excuse me how we've realised the value of our relationships when we couldn't, when we suddenly couldn't relate in the same way that we were used to, um, that kind of stress, that value of what, what those relationships mean, mean to us. You don't know what you've got till it's gone um, is, springs to mind. So from a, from a work perspective, I think that the enforced change in the way we work will, I believe, be um, a catalyst, acts as a catalyst for so many organisations who perhaps did not believe that working differently was possible. Um, I think that for me, I, 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 I'm a strong believer that we can all be our best selves when we are comfortable. Um, and as employers, we have to recognise that the whole person comes to work. I say that a lot. People hear me bang on about that all the time. And as employers, we have to understand what that means because never has that been truer than it has in the last 10 months or so. So COVID has taught us that balance is possible, that we can balance when we have to, our home priorities and our work priorities. And if we are comfortable at work with that balance, with there being elements of home crossing into elements of work, with children walking into meetings while we're on Teams calls, with dogs barking at the postman, or with bandwidth freezing mid-sentence, um, then we can be comfortable being our authentic selves at work. And as our authentic self, I truly believe that we can be, we can all do our best work when we are feeling comfortable in ourselves. So I really think it's all about balance. So I keep coming back to that word. As an employer, we need to shift our thinking and we, do, we need to do what we can to support that balance. It does not mean by any stretch of the imagination that it has to be 100% one way or the other. Uh, we did a working practices survey back in the summer last year and we had an overwhelming response from staff showing how much, how important this topic is to them. And one of the things that came out from that survey was people aren't looking to go all one way or all the other. They want balance. So I think through as an employer, through giving people the tools to manage their well-being, um, the guidance to help them manage their time and their work effectively, then we can possibly find that elusive work-life balance, work balance that we're all seeking. And I mean that through as employees and clients alike. We are all in the same boat. We're all human beings. We're all trying to find the same balance between work and home. And perhaps now is the time that that might actually be achievable. Real estate as an industry is built on relationships. We know that these relationships are best built in person, um, but then they are through a screen. But as we get through this last, well, hopefully last stretch of lockdown, I really hope we can see a balance between that in-person collaboration and that focused work time. It, that's the definition of agile working. It doesn't mean it has to be the same week on week or day to day, but if we have that trust in our people, um, and that trust goes both ways, then it doesn't matter. It can it can be flexible. It can work in an agile way. So just finally from me, um, on a personal note, um, I think I consider myself quite in tune with my own mental health. Um, I've always been aware as I've travelled the roller coaster of lockdown one, did what I needed to when I needed to do it um, to help with that journey. But one thing I really noticed as I came out of lockdown two, I went into the office for a couple of days and I really noticed the lift to my own spirits, um, which was something I hadn't quite appreciated that I'd needed until I came home that evening, feeling a little bit lighter in mood. And it was just about being able to chat with colleagues, to ask a question, to get a quick response without having to dial a call, made me appreciate that balance all the more. So it's just about it's just about balance. So I'm optimistic about the legacy of the pandemic and what it leaves with us on this front. I think there could be wider benefits to this change that we haven't yet appreciated. So I think that's something to watch out for. But yeah, I think it's I think it's it's been a good catalyst for change. Thank you. You do sound really optimistic. That's so wonderful to hear because you really are front line in this, managing you know a lot of plates yeah. spinning for you. Um, I imagine just in the last week. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, 
I think why I'm really interested, uh, just to kind of dive in a little bit more of the, on, into the Collier's journey, if I may, just what you can share, because um, it's been quite a big cultural shift. I and mean, you talk about trust, building trust. Like, what are the tools that you you give people in order to to build that trust to, to work so differently? I think that, um, I mean, I, I think that, you know, we're obviously, this isn't normal, we're not in normal times yet. We are still in lockdown. We're still, we're still all working under an enforced um, remote working. But one, one thing that we, we really recognise is that um, there's no one size fits all. So this isn't about putting um, heavy laden policy in place. It's about understanding and looking at the roles that people are doing um, and what that means, what, you know, what, what do those roles need? Um, and starting always with, with, with the work priorities, the client priorities, what are we trying to achieve? We want to do the best for our clients, that's at the forefront always. So starting at that point and then working out together through good communication, through open communication, sort of trusting people to sort of work, work with what will work for their clients and what works for what they need to do so you get that balance so there'll be sometimes you know for example if I had a week of meetings um, around business planning say that are much easier to do much better to do for me I get more out of them if I'm face to face then that might mean I have a, a whole week in the office but if the following week I've got a bit of report writing to do or I need to get my head into an excel spreadsheet then it makes sense for me to manage my time you know you manage your time but you're driven by the work priorities and what you're trying to get done I'm, I'm imagining because I mean this is a big ship to steer, Colliers. You've got many different uh, business lines and services and teams, etc. How how are you coordinating that across the different service streams, etc.? Well, I think that as I say, we're, we're still it's early days. We're still in we're still in the lockdown, but it's it's just with it's it's having those conversations with our business leaders. It's understanding. Um, and talking to them and understanding what they are, what what their business is needing at the moment, and just working with them on that basis. Mm. Have you have you been hearing any thriving stories from from the teams? Are, are things really working well somewhere? And have they I think that yeah, I mean we've had lots of examples where people, you know, I think people have said that it's the you know having these calls having teams calls which was i think for so many organizations a revelation back in march last year that you know perhaps hadn't used microsoft teams um in the way that it's been used um over the past 10 months but it's easier to have those calls and um, we've been running virtual promotion panels over the last couple of weeks and you know been able to have those those doing those with people somebody sitting in edinburgh and somebody sitting in another continent and um, you can carry on that you know that makes things a lot easier so there's been lots of um the easier it's easier to have those check-ins with mm. people um it's interesting isn't it everyone's learning curve's been so different over this last year really has it mm. there, there were teams that were already using the zooms the skypes the you know skype do you remember skype mm. um, <laughs> mention that for a while um, teams etc so some really had quite a bit yeah. like if I was to ask about the if I may the Collier's journey like where were you before that regards agility and, and where are you now I mean you've been forced to be agile but where are you on that journey do you think well, I think um, it's fair to say that before before this we we didn't have a huge amount of that kind of uh, well I'm trying to change the language I'm trying not to say working from home Hence my mm -hmm. there, because I think Great. I think actually this isn't about working from home or working in the office. This is about working in a way that is driven by your client needs, your work requirements, what you what you need to get done, and you work at a way that you know that might you might be working on a client site, you might be working with your client. So, um, uh, but I think that's fair, <clears throat> it's fair to say that before COVID, we didn't have a huge amount of that. Um, working remotely or working in a different way um but now i think obviously we well obviously everybody is working in this way and we've been able you know you can we can show that that works um and now it's about sort of that becoming the norm that becoming um as we as we come out of this lockdown hopefully in the next couple of months um and move into um you know what is the new normal? Another one of those awful phrases that we never really want to hear again. 
<laughs> let's ban it for the rest I think, of the you know, we've, we've, we've traveled we've traveled a long way in that short time and i think that's that's it's great awesome. it doesn't matter when you get to the party it doesn't matter what where you were before it's about you know you do it at the time that's right for your business mm. Thank you so much, Lydia. By all means, keep jumping in and uh, and contributing. You know, uh, I'm going to move us on to Rachel for her thought starters. And off you go, my dear. Unmute, of course. <laughs> Unmute. Uh, thank you, Amelia. Um, I think through the Loneliness Lab, it's obvious that the focus I'll take is on relationships and connections during this super socially isolated experience that we're all going through. Um, but before starting i'll just say that this you know it loneliness isn't new during this time and research dates back quite a few years um back in 2017 the british red cross found that we have nine million people who feel chronic loneliness in the uk and, and at around the same time the ex-surgeon general in the us vivek murthy um declared a loneliness epidemic um given that it creates this sort of perpetual state of stress. He said it has the same mortality rate as smoking 15 cigarettes a day, which is absolutely huge. Um, and also given we spend a third of our lives working, the experiences we have there are sort of a big contributor to the, the way that we feel. Um, the experience of loneliness is subjective. Um, it's when your sort of expectations of relationships or experiences aren't matched um, and you can feel lonely in a crowd from a work perspective. You know, you can spend all day in meetings, speaking to people and still at the end of the day, feel like you haven't actually connected with anyone. So I think it is a, a super important topic for us. Um, I think the, the value that I can maybe add to this discussion is giving some things to think about. But before I do that, I'll just give some insight to some of the, the things we've learned in the past few years through um, all the people we've worked with, hosting workshops, we've ran surveys, etc. Um, just to anchor some of those tips. Um, so, touching on something that Lydia said, I loved your um, I loved your thought points, Lydia. By the way, <laughs> um, but this brings in concepts of trust. Trust is is absolutely critical to actually building connections and relationships with people. Authenticity is um, really, really important in connecting meaningfully and feeling like you are connecting as your whole self. You know, people like me for who I am. Um, and it reminds me of a kind of really funny um, thing we talk about is whenever you're at work, that feeling when you walk through the boundary into the toilets, you sort of leave your work persona behind and you connect with people in a really different way. Why do we always have connect in sort of um, authentic ways whenever you bump into people in the loo? So I think that that's a really interesting um, sort of anecdote. Whenever we first went into lockdown, we started to kind of drop that workplace persona and connect in a similar way to we do whenever we're in public toilets. <laughs> um, agency is really important, feeling like you have a sense of control around what you're doing and also permission that you're sort of welcome to access the place you're in, you belong there and you, you know, you have access to the, the information around you. Um, the second bit of research is everyone has a different um, expectation of relationships at work. They range from you know, a, a big network of loose connections through to business relationships, social friendships, and then one that I've only recently sort of really understood, which is a relationship with your organization, feeling like you're um, valued as part of a group and bigger shared purpose beyond yourself. Um, all of these areas are struggling right now, but, but really, especially that one, um, all of them have very different types of places or sort of initiatives that help you to connect. For example, a, a business relationship might need a more intimate setting to have a one-to-one -one discussion and really build a strong um, connection with someone. Social friendships are areas that you can identify a shared interest, say something as simple as a bike rack to see that someone else cycles. Um, and that sort of connection with the business is an interesting one because it's probably the most easiest to do. It's just actually sharing information in the open, something like having a, a wall where you've got projects up so that people feel they've got permission to talk about those projects that other teams are working on um, is huge. Um, so that, um, that was the second piece. And then lastly, um, a bit of really interesting insight is um, where and how you work matters. It's probably not a surprise that we found uh, pre-COVID home and remote working um, 
is where people felt the most lonely, smaller offices um, and the ability to be mobile. So to have that choice and control over where and when and how you work and connect with people felt the, the least lonely. Um, so, so that's, that's some sort of really interesting insight um, that I think is really relevant just now. Um, so th things to think about, I think I'll start with kind of individuals and then just a couple on organizations. Um, firstly, um, and I, I've done this um, very much, be conscious of how you spend your time, especially time alone. Time alone is as important as time with other people to sort of re-energize, reboot, and get in touch with yourself to, to sort of check in on how you're feeling and, and be conscious of how you want to spend your time. So for me, what I do is find somewhere that I feel just very happy to be by myself um, to do that. Uh, this second point, and this comes back to that um, point on we can be in meetings all day and still feel lonely. It's the meaningful, not the many. So find time for one-to-ones, not just sort of group, group connection and group conversations. They'll make a huge difference. Um, but then the third one is, you know, be creative about the way that we're connecting. And this is important because when we first went into lockdown, you know, we were all in it together. It was exciting to see into one another's houses, but the longer we're in it, it becomes a bit monotonous. People are starting to turn off their cameras and, you know, we really have no idea how long this is going to go on for. So find ways to build more sort of exciting and different, um, ways to connect with people because that positivity is infectious and others will start to do it too. Um, so that's just a, a couple of tips for individuals in terms of connecting. Um, for organizations, there is a, you know, there's a, a huge sort of business case to invest in supporting people. Um, the New Economics Foundation in 2017 found that private businesses um, were losing 2.2 to 3.7 billion a year in um, loneliness through sickness leave, absenteeism, presenteeism, um, productivity, turnover. Um, so it's, there's, a, there's a, a big reason to want to invest in this. Um, and again, these are all super, super, super simple um, tips. But firstly, practice psychological safety for your people. You know, belonging is a really basic human need. So, so just by thinking about how to make people feel safe and, and in this case as well physically safe with you know a, a, a virus around um, just through simple um, communication that makes people feel that you're being transparent with them that's super super important um, building that sort of shared purpose and belonging across the the whole company um, is important to make people feel like you know, they have that shared purpose and that can be as simple as an all staff call so that everyone feels like they know what's going on beyond the teams and you know, that they're in and the, the people that they see day to day on Teams or Zoom. Um, and then lastly, find, and this is the bit more creative one, find opportunities for people to feel like they're in it together and they have a shared purpose, even if it's a silly project. Um, actually boost the team morale by putting them into work on it together and you know finding ways to feel like they're trying to to tackle something as a group not just by themselves um, so I mean I could talk about this forever um, <laughs> but I will stop there but I'll, I'll just end and try and be on a positive note like Lydia was envision that we you know we've come out of this and we're all a bit more experienced a bit more resilient a bit more positive what lessons can we take from this time to make sure that the, the new normal, as uh, Lydia said, um, it's not just going back to where we were before, we're actually carrying the, the good things with us. And I'll touch on those points that I've sort of said originally, the um, firstly, reflecting on that choice, people with choice are the least lonely. So in terms of policy, thinking about actually giving people flexibility in where and how they work and when they work. Um, and the, the choice around that will be really important. Uh, programming will be important, actually bringing people together, the right people at the right time in, in, a, in a place um, to build that social glue is important. And then finally, the sort of physical maximizing whenever people do come together, those opportunities to connect, to be nudged, um, to interact with one another and to feel like, you know, they're, they're sort of still all in it, 
it together, even though, you know, we'll, we'll say the virus is over. Um, so, you know, given we don't know how long this will go on for actually being proactive and um, showing people that you are trying to make positive changes will at least give them something to look forward to. Um, that's it. There's heaps more information on the website if anyone is interested. <laughs> I think, uh, well, I know that you do do webinars yourself as the loneliness lab, but I could listen to you for hours because <laughs> it's fascinating, really. Um, you said something earlier and you know me by now, Rachel. I just I, I go on weird little <laughs> rabbit holes in my head. So, <laughs> so here we go. You said something about workplace personas, and I love that we have a different persona for the lose, but we so do. <laughs> like, what is that? Um, but isn't that interesting? So it almost like we've gone through a bit of an identity crisis in the last year. Like, so we've had, and you've said, Lydia, as well, we bring our whole selves, but that's quite a vulnerable thing to do, isn't it? It's like you can be quite buttoned up and your own thing when you're, you know, you step through the um, the doors into work and then suddenly you're kind of letting everybody in. And that's, I imagine that's quite a, a vulnerable place to be that you, and you kind of need permission from others to be you. I don't know what the question is there, but it just seemed, it struck me that I think we've all, that's part of this, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, really, really small bits. And Lydia, um, in People and Culture, I'm sure you're much more well versed than me. But a really small, small thing for me is even just seeing people in casual clothing. You get a completely different uh, perspective into who they are. And I think that's been a really powerful thing of seeing people at home. You, you also get to see days that maybe they're feeling, you know, a bit better than others based on how, you know, how they've got up, how they've dressed, what's going on around them. Um, and I think that's actually, for me, very much helped in the way that I've worked with my colleagues, because you, you can be a bit more empathetic to maybe what's going on in their life and, you know, take a bit more slack. And you know that you know, whenever the same's going on with you, they will and you'll help each other get through it. I think the um, the whole self piece that that sort of perhaps started around um, the DNI um, agenda, you know, that that sense of inclusivity and creating a culture and an environment that is inclusive for everybody. But I think that it's gathered a bit of for me, it's gathered a bit of momentum, particularly over this past year, because we are literally talking to each other in their be in bedrooms, in kitchen tables, in in studies where people are lucky enough to have space to have a study. You know, so so I think that's where you are literally bringing your whole self to the office um, as you have your your calls and things. And I think it's 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 about trust. It's about feeling um, that then comes back to the relationships that you're having with um, with your employer, with your colleagues, where you can trust and you can. It, it's OK. It's OK to to be whatever you're feeling that day. It doesn't mean you can't be productive. It doesn't mean you can't get on with your work, but it might be. Do you know what? Can you just. I can't really talk to people today, but I'm just going to crack on and get on with what I need to do. So it's it's just that's that's trust being able to say that it is it does make you vulnerable, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. But I think well, that could. when you have that relation, it could make you vulnerable. But when you have that relationship, it doesn't need to because it can feel safe. We did a really interesting thing um, at the start of lockdown. Whenever that everything went virtual, we started to host um, what we were calling communities which is every Thursday, anyone could dial in to this community and you bring your own cup of tea and just talk about things. It might be work related, it might be life related. Um, but the idea is that you're sort of meeting different people. And, and in that you're outside of your sort of the face of your organization and people that you don't even know are starting to boost your spirits and kind of help you work through something or maybe there's a bunch of people feeling the same thing. It was very, um, connected to the sort of COVID lockdown situation. But but actually that in itself was quite helpful. And I've seen this, I can't remember what it's called, but there's a um, various platforms now that people can um, sign up for to work. And there are strangers sitting on the screen. They obviously can't see what you're doing, 
but the, the idea of it was for productivity so that during your day there's someone watching you at the beginning of say a two hour slot you'll say i'm i need to get this done in the next two hours and then at the end of it everyone will say i got it done or i didn't but actually it introduced people and started to to make them feel less lonely because there's other people sitting there while you're working not talking just you know also working it's along co-working with yeah, it's it's um it's virtual quite, space. Yeah, it's quite interesting. So driven by productivity, it actually had a big influence on you know people's positivity and feeling like they're in something together, even outside their organisation. I'm going to move us on to Chris so that we definitely get through everything. But there's like a million questions <laughs> already coming in and everything. So I'm going to move us along to Chris. Thank you so much, Rachel. Chris, over to you. Yeah, thanks, uh, Rachel, Lydia. That's that's great insight. Um, I think looking at this through a slightly different lens, um, my role over the last ten years has really been supporting organisations to try to design strategies to support their workforce in order to to flourish and succeed in the workplace. And it's often been led um, by the perceived innovators. Um, you know, notable examples of these perhaps are are Google, who we did a significant amount of work with over the last ten years, and amongst other things, they provided. Uh, a worldwide food strategy to, to all of their people, providing not just food for free, but actually an incredibly complex strategy to, to reduce um, the, the, the foods which don't assist people in, in performing better at work from, from their offer. And so there are really complex solutions like that, which you know, you'd have to applaud, but the cost of that as an organization is vast. And, and then in contrast to that, you've got organizations like Tesla, um, who have the majority of their workforce on a, on a shop floor um, and they would engage our coaches to offer movement quality sessions to ensure all of the workers were warmed up for the day and had, had flexed the right muscles in order to, to be able to uh, maximize the production output. And then standard programs these days with the likes of Jim, Jim offers uh, on-site health assessments, physiotherapies and, and even GPs based in clinics in, in organizations has become a, a sort of the standard go-to package for some of the financial services organizations. And, and it's been a pleasure over the last 10 or 15 years working with them to try and be inspirational in designing these great programs. However, um, you know, in, in the last five years, things were shifting dramatically and not, not every organization can do that. And, and the focus started to become on flexibility, inclusivity and a well-being program that was more blended to the culture of the organization. But that was then, and all of a sudden, after uh, we're hit with COVID 12 months ago, there is a need for all organizations to embrace this challenging time. And, uh, and every single business is now looking for their own point of view on what works to help them to keep their prized asset, that is the, their people, um, you know, happy and successful and allow them to thrive, but not in the office right now from home. And um, so best laid plans, you know, um, go a long way. And yet, there is definitely, as Rachel just said, a sense of isolation um, with with being based from home every day. We can spend many hours, as most of us have done recently, on calls, and and that gives an abil inability to connect, um, receive feedback, uh, get a, re a decent reality check on things, and even to celebrate sort of the successes, the small things, etc. So I think in order to make our flexible home environment as successful as it can be. I think the time has come really for for not just for us to to rely on our employers to give us programs and, and the opportunity, but actually for us to take on the right behaviours to to succeed ourselves. I think really it's down to to us. I think fundamentally, if we were wondering what what are the table stakes we can expect from our employers, at the very least, it's probably just a sense of permission, trust. Um, flexibility to work from home as we'd like to. And, and then possibly even some of the leading organizations as Lydia has discussed are, are starting to provide services and programs from home. Um, but I think it's down to, to us as individuals to take some control. So, so what is it that you are advising your clients to tell their individuals about how to, how to meet them in the middle? In a way, they're, they're providing these tools, like Lydia is providing these tools and, and support how are you getting people on board? Well, I guess the value I, I bring to this, this conversation is probably just a lot of the philosophy that's been successful um, over the last 10 years has been focused around what we call the four pillars of performance. People often see performances as being focused on high-end athletes, but 
performance is absolutely about everybody all day. It's about recovering from from injury. It's about getting up in the morning and being able to perform. Um, it's about being the best version of ourselves on a daily basis. And um, we have a philosophy based around four pillars, which is mindset, movement, nutrition, and recovery. Um, they are all completely interlinked uh, and probably of equal importance because without one, you struggle to, to have the other. Uh, and yet, um, having spoken to our founder about this on many occasions, uh, I believe that recovery probably is the one that without some form of recovery and the ability to go again the next day, um, it is very challenging. And yet I think what the, the period of lockdown has led us to is, is more time just as, as um, Rachel stated, on our own, isolated, and you kicked off the, the um, discussion today yourself, Amelia, talking about um, you know needing to to be able to recharge, getting our heads in the right place. So for me, I think today I, you know, I want to discuss a little bit more about the mindset piece. I think you know it's it's down to us to be disciplined, um, accept that that responsibility is there for us to do, and and there are some really simple strategies I believe that we can all take to take back some of that control. Um, many life coaches will will tell you there's lots of different ways to address some of these challenges, but um, quite simply, how can we plan for success, um, which also means planning to be prepared for for the challenges. And I'm going to kick us off kind of with two fundamental drivers, I think. One of them is to focus on building self-confidence uh, or self-efficacy, as the psychologist would say. And it, it's tough to do because those sort of the, the most important words we'll hear every day are probably the words we tell ourselves um, in the back of our heads. So I think it's being able to compartmentalize the good from the bad and knowing when you want to to take a thought forward. Um, whereas, you know, putting putting one aside and just letting that one go. And it's also being able to plan um, to enjoy the things you can and, and, and focus on the things you have mastery of and are good at. And, and the second um, big ticket item for me is to to have a toolkit of really quite simple interventions. And interventions is always a, a bit of a tech, you know, technical, psychological word, but really it's activities, games, call them what you will, um, that you can practice, practice in your own time, um, rehearse, and be able to, to draw upon as and when you need them to deal with the challenges you may face. Um, and these will allow us to to yeah to, to to focus on the and the important things i think um for me the the most important of these probably just worth a a brief discussion really is about recognizing and interpreting stress in a different way so i think we've spent a lot of time as an organization working on the ability to refocus and reframe stress um and so i you know identifying uh, the three steps of this without getting into too much detail identifying point of stress. They come up a lot on the calls. I think Lydia mentioned, you know, your Wi-Fi signal drops out. You, you're not invited to a meeting expected you would be or the kids walk into the room. You know, acknowledge the trigger, um, the source of mental or physiological challenge. I think then about being able to recognize your, your sensations, whatever they may be, um, both physiological and psychological, change of breathing, frustration, starting to feel slightly sweaty. And um, or, or whether it's just a change in the heart rate, you know, you're starting to feel frustrated, um, allowing those thoughts and emotions to rise, recognizing them, accepting them. And then the second part of this is pausing. So just intentionally taking a little bit of time to interpret what's going on. The better we the better we recognize it, the more we can become used to it. Um, slow your reaction. Take some time and remember to anchor back to to the positive, the preparation, the planning you've done, um, and maybe having a positive mantra at times like that. And then visualize your own state of resilience. And, and finally then it's about reframing the third part. Um, again, more of a psychological word, but just being able to redefine that stressor as something we can see as positive. And I think if we can get into the practice of turning the little things that build up over the course of a day into something positive, those can 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 really end up being something we can put to one side, um, choose to ignore, or or actually build on the positives upon. 
And then some of those exercises, and I'm going to stop in a second, but can then be supplemented with some really simple things like breathing exercises, relaxation exercises. And quite simply, when we talk about planning for the day, just taking some time to do the things that you enjoy. So we might have six or seven Zoom calls in a day back to back, but hey, you've got to find the right five minutes to do something that stimulates you in a different way. I think what you're saying is really important, actually, because even if you ignored it in the last two lockdowns, this isn't going anywhere. A toolkit is required. So and there is a plethora of things available. So and it's about what works for you, isn't it? Hundred um, yeah. Can I just ask all three of you, like just really quickly, what, what is actually working for you? How what allows you to thrive in your day? Where do you want to start? <laughs> Go on, Chris. <laughs> You've just um, given us some great pointers. What, what, which ones do you take most heed of? So, going based on what I think a lot of what I just said, I think for me, trying to get a sense of normality in a in a, in a world which doesn't feel particularly normal in many ways right now. Mm -hmm. um, I've always been a glass half full person. I think so. I try and see the positives instinctively. Uh, and at the same time, have always been a, a relatively competitive person. So for me, trying to bring that sense of normality back, there's, there's three things I'll touch on very quickly. One of them is, you know, um, our, as Aristotle said, we are truly community based um, beings and we thrive being part of a community. So whilst that community has been um, severed from us right now in, in, to a greater extent, I think the ability to go for a walk with the family uh, I've even managed to drag my teenage kids out walking. And when at first, for the first lockdown, they they um, rejected that. Now they're actually quite excited. And it gives us a chance just to talk about things because they're on Zoom calls all day. So I think that as a general get away from it all, just find half an hour to, to go for walks, being incredibly powerful. For me personally, more from a, from a sort of competitor perspective, I think doing a, a daily body check, and that sounds like a funny thing to say, but but when you wake up in the morning, looking for pain points you know as you get older these things occur and actually pain is a huge cause of, of of stress and anxiety identifying those pain points and doing some simple stretches some movement quality i uh, didn't get a chance to talk much about the movement piece which which is probably exos and, and speciality but i think just doing some foundational movements um and and it's easy to invest in things like a foam roller or a massage gun or some little massage balls, they, they really do help in terms of identifying those little pain points and spending a few minutes working on those, coupling that up with a breathing exercise, the right, really powerful way to go. And then the final thing I have to say is that digital technology has taken over the world. Gyms haven't been open for the majority of the year. And I read a really interesting article yesterday talking about how the fitness world has changed and it's never going to go back to quite what it was. You know, unfortunately, many of the operators will be having to close down given the, the tough financial constraints they've been under. Um, but the world has changed and there's many, many digital platforms have popped up all over the place. And I'm sure that people have found their own options. Some employers have recommended for me riding a bike on Swift and being part of a community has been an incredibly inspirational experience that I'd never done before. But there are some great digital platforms providing content at very low cost to people. Uh, which allow you to participate in all sorts of community-based classes. I think Les Mills on demand is a is a particularly well-renowned one. So there's all sorts out there that people can try. And for me, Zwift has been just inspirational. So I found myself cycling just about every day. <laughs> so exercise um, and just very. I, I've got quite a few questions coming in. Can I jump over to those first? Because there's. Sure. I jumped in ahead of the ladies. I think. Would you like to share what you do to thrive, ladies? I feel like um, it's important yeah, to share. Um, yeah, very, very quickly, because um, I'm conscious of time, but I think for me, it's uh, my motto at the moment is one day at a time. Um, nice. uh, and I think that that's really important to, to not sort of set yourself up to think I'm going to do a bit like New Year's resolutions. I'm going to get all this done. Um, this is all the things I'm going to change. That's one thing. And the other thing is just being aware of how you're feeling so you know as an example last night i looked at my diary for today and i saw that it was pretty back to back all day from half past eight and and i decided that i would get up early and go for a run and so this morning in the wet and the rain and the mud um i went for a run um 
and was very annoyed that my Apple Watch failed me and said I'd only done 10 minutes, but I had actually done 5K. But, you know, it for me, that was really important. Um, so it's recognising when when you need to do something and what that might be. And that, that was exercise this morning. Tomorrow it might be sitting quietly, listening to doing a meditation or doing something, you know, that's just, you know, so it's just one day at a time. Lovely. Thank you, Lydia. I'll, I'll be quick too. Just ref it's, I mean, it, it's all um, sort of reflecting on the same thing. Cycling and yoga are my go-to self time. So just making sure um, I actually make time for that. Also thinking, you know, no matter how bad the day is, what have I learned today? And it might be, you know, I've been on this project and learned some some really tangible stuff, but it might just be I've learned not to care whenever something goes really wrong, you know. Um, and then the last thing I was just going to mention is there's just really terrible news all the time and social media is full of it as well. So I, at the beginning of this, found some really good websites that share, you know, they, they might be silly or they might be really great and fantastic and huge, but just good news stories only. Um, good News Network is one of them. Highly recommend. Um, always nice to just look and give yourself a bit of a little energy boost. Mm. I think media is a big one for me, certainly, um, coupled with a gratitude practice, uh, as you say, being there, and um, Earl Grey tea. So those, those were what make me thrive. Uh, <laughs> I started a business in a pandemic, for goodness sake. I mean, <laughs> there was also wine. Um, okay, so we've got loads of questions. I think, Lydia, quite a few of these are kind of directed towards the HR perspective, so get comfy. <laughs> uh, <laughs> there is one here from, um, from Laszlo. Um, has Collier's implemented HR-driven mental health, work from home, or other COVID-related employee support programs? And how did they change their communication strategy during the pandemic? Um, yes, uh, we have implemented lots of different things throughout the pandemic and we've tried to sort of uh, adapt as we've gone. Um, so communication, there was lots of communication at the beginning and then, you know, we recognised that, you know, email overflow um, for people. So we made sure we had, um, we put everything on our intranet site. Um, so just trying to sort of mix up the communication to try and make sure we're getting those messages through to people. Um, the HR, uh, we, we did Mental Health Awareness Week. We did, uh, we've introduced uh, Wellness Wednesday emails, which initially were weekly. So every week we sent um, an email on a Wednesday called Wellness Wednesday, which had little tips like just, you know, be kind to yourself or, or get some, stru you know, started off with things around structure in your day and, and making sure that you have a defined finish time at the end of the day, things like that. And then as time went on, it was, it sort of, it moved into different topics, um, focusing on different things. Um, for Mental Health Awareness Week, we did um, a fun uh, loo roll challenge. Um, I don't know if you saw the toilet roll challenge um, that many it was going around social media um, last year, but we did that as a kind of spreading the kindness. The theme for Mental Health Awareness Week was spreading kindness. So we spread the kindness via a loo roll around the country and everybody filmed a little um snapshot of them with the with the toilet roll we put that together so just trying to just do different things that we're get that we're getting the message through to people um and reminding our line managers um so we changed we did quite quickly we we did some remote management training so that was one of the first things we did we we flipped our training all to virtual and we one of the first courses we got out to all of our line managers straight away was how to manage remotely and it was just picking up on on different things to look out for. Um, and we've done that again, actually, to remind people, you know, if people aren't putting their cameras on, you know, you might need to just be aware that that could be somebody who's struggling to get out of bed, struggling to get dressed in the morning. They don't want to be seen. So making sure that we're asking the questions. So lots of so we've done quite a lot around that topic um, throughout the year. I think that's quite important, isn't it? It's like we you might have established something in the first lockdown but it's actually not quite relevant or it needs yeah. a slight redesign or a, a shift in its perspective now because it's different um yeah. and people yeah. are getting fatigued with the amount of adrenaline the constant change but those same rules don't apply yeah. in a way yeah. so 
One of the other things we introduced was the Collier's Companion, which was uh, sort of targeted at people. It was particularly around the bank holidays. We had quite a lot of bank holidays, um, obviously, straight after lockdown started. Mm. And that was that worked quite well in terms of just pairing people up who might live alone, just might want somebody to chat to, watch a film with remotely, obviously. Um, that was quite successful. But as you say, we've had to adjust that. And, you know, now in lockdown three, the quiz has died. Um, or I think everyone's so, you know, everyone's just a bit fed up of quizzes, but we're now doing a, another challenge around the world, an eighty days challenge around sort of just sort of trying to unite everybody in a in an exercise challenge because we you know we recognise it's this lockdown feels hard in a way, even though it feels like hopefully it's the last one. But anyway, I, I will stop because so, I'm quite really conscious of the time. <laughs> I know, Chris, uh, you're on mute, love. I think you're speaking though. So. Sorry, I was just going to ask Lydia, what sort of engagement are you getting across the population for those sorts of uh, activities? Um, I think it varies. Uh, so Collier's Companion, um, I think we we paired up 16 pairs, you know, but 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 actually it's that kind of if it reaches one person, if it helps one or two people, then, you know, and they're easy things to do, then um but it, you know it's makes wellness wednesday i get you know quite a lot of feedback in the surveys we've done i've seen feedback that that's been a useful email to get people have appreciated it quite often get comments back so it it varies from the, so, but i think it's it's having variety so that people can dip into the things that resonate with them there's been a question just come in and it's reminded me of something that i'd like to pick up with um with you um so there's um the one that's just come in i don't know if you guys can see it this pandemic i'm so sorry i don't know how to say your name but Holt, the, the surname is holst so thank you for this this pandemic has highlighted and amplified many weak points within our society loneliness insecurity a need for belonging empowerment depression work-life balance etc None of them are new, but homeworking and the impact on work life has given it a face and a name. With people being creatures of habit, do you anticipate, and this is for the whole, whole team, I think, do you anticipate we will go back to the old ways once this pandemic is over? Or do you expect we will find new solutions for these underlying challenges? Where do you think we will adapt to thrive in a new and improved way? Who'd like to pick that one up? It's beautifully put. I'm thinking of um, back when activity-based working was first, just first brought in, um, actually making a point to say for people who are creatures of habit and thrive in doing that, that's okay. <laughs> um, mm. But I, I think in this situation, um, a lot of small structural changes are happening to actually change what that future looks like now especially for really sort of progressive organizations, but individuals as well. Um, we, uh, the Loneliness Lab ran a sort of series of workshops back in September called Design to Connect. And there were specific streams, you know, how's workplace changed, how has home life changed, how has, you know, the high street changed. And we actually found there was a huge crossover between all of them because people are actually putting things in place to say, you know, I, um, I've, created a you know a workplace within my home and it's working really well i've met all of my neighbors now that i didn't know before and therefore i i don't need as much connection within the workplace and actually it's my expectation of that relationships change a bit or you know i know that i can go down to the high street um and work in a cafe there's so i think um i i i don't know the answer to that but i really hope that these like really small changes will um, make a big difference as well as that a lot of the organizations that I've spoken to um, in terms of corporate real estate and ways of working it's not just you know uh, the corporate real estate team or the FM team it is people in culture at the forefront the digital team is you know well on board to make sure there's a seamless experience and we're able to connect people who are remote and people who are t physically together in person um, so I think that has come to the forefront for a lot of organizations faster than it would have previously to sort of engage those changes yeah i know countries of time amelia but just very quickly in the proof points that the proof points that i would share is that prior prior to lockdown um i believe that you know 
organizational well-being strategies were moving in this direction, but at nothing like the speed. I think what these lockdowns and this period of time has shown us and has actually been a proof point for organizations is that it's not just employee driven, but actually most of these organizations can cope and can exist and continue to do business in, in a different world. And so um, I think it, it varies to some degree. Um, the organizations I've spoken to uh, recently and on a regular basis recognize that the number of employees back in the office, for example, will be significantly less and therefore things will change. How far they go down the continuum, I think will be down to their ability to adapt. But I, I think employees want to view things differently. And I think in future organizations will recognize that's a need. So I unfortunately, I can't get to all of the amazing questions that came up. It it basically means we have to meet again, guys. We have to do a 2.0 on this. Um, I'm so sorry I didn't get to everyone's, but I've got to wrap up on time for you all to get on with your days. So we've had three very different perspectives from different corners of the world, and yet we've seen some really common themes, I think, today. In order to thrive, we need to dig into trust, communication, choice, that no size fits all, um, and that the responsibility for well-being is a meeting in the middle of the individual and the organization. And that it's a journey and permission to redesign and redesign again and keep shifting and changing as you need to. So I'd like to thank you all for joining uh, a really great session and thank you, the panelists, Lydia, Chris, Rachel, for your incredible insights. Um, Tamara and Sarah for putting us together. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, Steph at SAS for coordinating all of this with us. And again, to our sponsors, um, it's who make it all, who make Cornet possible. It has been a joy to work with you all. As uh, my hero, Dr. Brené Brown would say, stay awkward, brave and kind. That's it from all of us, my dears. Have a wonderful day. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs>